Perfecto, pues eh, estamos listos para iniciar nuestro tercer y último día del taller Go16. Por supuesto agradecemos la presencia y el interés de todos ustedes que hacen posible llevar a cabo este taller. Eh, hoy tendremos eh, programado un par de presentaciones a cargo del doctor Scott Lindstrom. La primera es sobre instrumentos ABI, productos nuevos y simulaciones. Posteriormente tendremos un breve receso y luego continuará, es tan extenso el tema de instrumentación ABI que habrá una continuación con el doctor eh, Lindstrom para concluir. Posteriormente tenemos la comida y para terminar el día hay una visita al Laboratorio Nacional de Observación de la Tierra, el LANOT, que se encuentra aquí en el edificio contiguo a 30 metros saliendo derechito. Pero eh, como es un poco pequeño, vamos a tener que hacer grupos de 20 personas para que todos tengamos la oportunidad de entrar y aproximadamente dura la visita 20 minutos. Y después de eso, pues ya eh, dejamos el día como, como concluido. Eh, para mañana, iniciamos el taller GNC, en donde va a cambiar la dinámica. Ya no va a ser aquí, es importante mencionarlo, va a ser otra vez ya en el de jueves y viernes, serán en el, las instalaciones de Lanot, aquí enfrente, como les mencionaba, porque es una cuestión ya más de entrenamiento con computadoras y así. Y eh, vamos a tener una, un simulacro muy interesante el viernes sobre qué nos va a dar la NASA, sobre qué hacer en caso de desastres en, en tema de la comunicación de los organismos e instituciones involucrados eh, bajo presión, porque hay un desastre que atender, cómo tienen que comunicarse, cómo tienen que sacar la información al público, y etcétera Va a ser muy dinámico, muy interesante, en un lugar abierto, para que cambiemos de paisaje y no estemos encerrados todo el tiempo. Eh, también les quiero mencionar algo de mañana que era... Ah, sí, mañana tenemos una, un working lunch, un, una comida de trabajo, en donde estamos comiendo para todos aquellos que son operadores que tienen una antena Geonetcast, porque los colegas de NOAA que están trabajando en este tema de GNC, que, que es Natalia, Paul y um, Diego, nos van a dar eh, una, van a compartir la experiencia de cómo hacer una red con estas estaciones GNC que actualmente las que están, las 11 que están en México se utilizan individualmente, pero se le puede sacar mucho más provecho y más jugo a esa información haciendo una red. Entonces nos van a compartir la experiencia de Brasil, nos van a dar algunas ideas y esto pues con la intención de que todos los que tenemos una GNC aquí en México podamos replicar esta experiencia y sacarle más provecho a la información que no sea útil eh, para todos nosotros. Entonces, sin más preámbulo, antes que el doctor Lindstrom comience su presentación, eh, nos van a dar una, James McNeith nos va a dar una pequeña okay. introducción sobre un tema que se quedó pendiente. Okay, Entonces, gracias, muchas gracias. Okay, gracias. Good morning, uh, thank you. We, uh, we want to keep you up to date on uh, schedule changes as they're announced. Uh, we uh, received some additional information uh, late yesterday that we'll share with you today in regards to the schedule for GO17. The uh, product validation schedule uh, is updated uh, as often as we, uh, as we can, and I do uh, distribute this to the GRB user group, uh, which Gabby is an active uh, member, so I'll be sending this out today, and I uh, just wanted to brief you on the update. So, um, as I, so I'll just read this information. A new product validation schedule was released yesterday for GO17. Uh, it's on the screen here. We have a tentative date of August 27th to hold our review, that's our peer stakeholder product validation review, for the GO17 ABI beta maturity. So on the schedule, you'll see uh, a change from what I showed you um, earlier in the week, on Monday, the change is that we now have a beta review scheduled for August, uh, August 27th for ABI. If, uh, if that results in a beta maturity uh, level, okay, thanks. If that, is that on? Okay, if, uh, if that results in a beta maturity level, uh, validation, 
then the information that's available on, on ABI will be transmitted on GRB the day after, and that would be August uh, 28th. So if the review is successful, then uh, whichever products are at the beta maturity level, uh, those will be re uh, put on the GRB on the 28th. So our administrator, Dr. Volz, uh, and the GOZAR program director, Pam Sullivan, gave a briefing to the media yesterday on the latest GO17 ABI status. And um, that, if you go to the NOAA NESDIS website and select press, you'll be able to see that press release at, that I briefed yesterday, and you can listen to the audio recording. The briefing is about 15 minutes long, followed by another 15 minutes of questions and answers. So some additional information that I didn't announce yesterday. We do plan to make GO-17 operational. And what I mean by that is that uh, NOAA would assume responsibility for the satellite operations by the end of the calendar year. Any other configurations to the satellite constellation are still under review by several different anomaly resolution teams. And we'll know more about that within the next couple of months. So are there any uh, questions? OK, thank you. I just wanted to make sure you, that you had the latest information. Uh, OK, the question was, at what position will it be operational? And that has not been released yet. Um, also, what has not been released yet as to what the role of the uh, GOES-15 or GOES-14 would be in regards to um, operating those satellites, at, um, and, and, we, and we were not ready to announce of what uh, longitude they would be operating at yet either. But obviously, one of the options is to um, use our constellation as well as we can, so we uh, we're looking at the entire constellation, including GOES-14 and GOES-15 and GOES-17. Okay, thank you. Where's my... I'm looking for my cursor. Cursor, where are you? Right into here. Working out. Oh, there it is. So what Jim means is on August 28th, GO17 ABI will be flowing in the GRB, and you'll have a lot more data to save. <laughs> <laughs> Buy your disk storage now. <laughs> Okay, before I start about t talking about FIRE, I, heard, I learned something last night about GLM in my email. Uh, the GLM imagery that I showed you for the, from the Weather Service has been processed in a way that's different from what's flowing over the GRB. So the GLM that you see on the GRB has been parallax corrected to a climatological cloud height. The stuff that is flowing to the National Weather Service, so those images that I was showing you, has had the parallax removed because that's what's, what the forecasters wanted. Um, so when you see GLM imagery, I guess the thing to ask yourself is where did it come from? Because the parallax shift will be different based on whether it's coming from the National Weather Service, from a w National Weather Service office, which is what I was showing you, the stuff from Bill Lyon, who was in the National Weather Service in Pueblo, or if it's coming from something like real Earth, 
or from a GRB, from your GRB, it'll have a different parallax correction. But it's, I guess the good news is the parallax correction is going to be constant depending on the source. So if you're just looking at one source, you will have the same kind of parallax correction. So I hope, I hope that was clear. <laughs> uh, it's confusing to me because there are two parallax corrections and you have to know what the source of the imagery you're looking at is. Um, but anyway, so to the, the first topic I'm talking, talking about today is fire detection. Um, kind of timely, I, you may have heard about the deadly wildfires in Greece in the past couple of days that might, I don't know if they've been extinguished or not, so wiped out a town, killed more than 60 people, something like that, so uh, uh, gives you pause. Okay, so um, I'm giving the talk, but the person who's really responsible for this product is someone I work with, Chris Schmidt. So he's been involved in the uh, wildfire automa automa automated biomass burning algorithm, or WFABA, um, for uh, 15 or 20 years now. He inherited it from Elaine Prinz, who is the person who started it. Uh, she was a NOAA employee. Still might be, I'm not sure. Um, so I hope to do it justice. Uh, this is a lot of Chris Schmidt's work. And uh, I'll give you his contact at the end of the talk. So the agenda is shown here, the science behind fire detection. It was touched on a little bit in the questioning yesterday, mostly using the shortwave infrared and the 11.2 microns and some other channels. The history of fire detection, the um, FDCA, uh, is the, I'm blanking on the algorithm, algorithm na the uh, acronym right now, fire detection and character characterization algorithm. That's the GO-16 version of WFABA. Um, so I'll show you a test case over Canada and just where to find it online. And I guess what I can tell you for that last bullet is you can't find it online yet. <laughs> but you can find the ABI data that goes into it. So at the end of this lesson, I hope you'll learn, you'll understand these things, understand which ABI bands are important for fire detection, understand why those bands work, um, appreciate how sensitive ABI is to fire sources within a pixel. This is really amazing to me that, I'll show you an example. Well, I don't want to give away um, the whole talk at the beginning. Um, and know where to find fire products online. Um, GOES 16, FDCA has not reached final maturity, so it's still in the provisional maturity. It's undergoing testing and revisions. So um, you will see, if you look at it, bugs and defects that they're still working on. A lot of that is related to the really nice accuracy of GO-16. Um, and it's, it's so much easier to detect fires now than with the algorithm that was de developed with legacy GOES. So a brief history, this is kind of wordy, I'm not going to read it, but it's here and you, you can download this PowerPoint at the end to get a little history on this. But basically, this is something that Elaine Prinz, who was a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin, uh, started this and then they migrated it to operations. So there are 16 channels. 3.9 is the most sensitive and was actually designed for fire detection, it's, so it has a very large dynamic range. It detects up to, I believe, 411 Kelvin. So very hot temperatures, it can, it can detect those. But you can see fires in all, you can see fires sometimes in every single band. And I'm just gonna step through for this particular image here. Uh, here we have the bay. This is the um, fire in, um, it's in, in Sonoma and Napa counties uh, last October that was pretty damaging to some of the vineyards there. This is the blue band. So this is at night. <coughs> There's not typically not enough energy being emitted in the visible by fires to be detected by ABI. So this is, you, do, you really won't see anything in the blue band at night. So you will see stuff in, during the day, but not at night. Here we have the red band, the 0.64, this is the highest resolution. And again, you're really not seeing any fire signal here. Um, Chris has played with this image to stretch it 
So you're really not seeing much of the albedo here, um, just an albedo of 0 0.01. So the pattern in here is due to remapping, detector biases, stuff like that. So you can see a signal in here. There's a, there's a signal in the noise, but it has nothing to do with fire. If you look at the veggie band, though, you're starting to see energy. So, you, you know, think about um, the energy being released as, you, as, a, as a fire is burning. As it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, it gets to shorter and shorter wavelengths. Of course, if it's burning with the energy of the sun, then you'll have something in the visible. Um, not a lot of fires get to be that hot, thankfully. But we, oops. But we do see in this image some of the fires, some of the hottest fires, are, do have a signal to 0.86. Again, this is all emitted energy because it's nighttime. You can see the same thing in the cirrus channel. So this was a fairly dry air mass, as you might expect from the fire. So you're actually seeing down to the surface, and you're seeing a small signal in the cirrus channel. Again, the, you're, these are very small values. We're looking at albedos of 0 0.02 as a maximum. <coughs> Here we have the snow ice band, so we're getting a really much stronger signal here. So the albedo here is up to 0 0.602, so you're getting a fair amount of energy. So the one in the circle here is a fairly weak fire, but it's still showing up in the 1.6, shows up in the 2.2. You'll notice here the difference in resolution. This is one kilometer, this is snow ice channel. The 2.2 is two kilometer resolution. And then we have here we have the original image that I started with. Um, so that we're just looking at fairly warm. We're not looking, yes, we're looking at over the entire dynamic range of the 3.9 micron here. So this is the most sensitive, uh, most sensitive ABI channel to fires. Water vapor, of course, there's enough water vapor in the atmosphere here that it's absorbing this energy. Um, so if this were even if this were very dry, we might be able to see some of the fires, but nothing is showing up at the 6.2. You're starting to see something very. You can kind of see something in the 6.9, and then the 7.3, which is the water vapor that sees farthest down in the atmosphere. You do have a signal. Here's the 8.4. The signals are still there. 9.6. There's a lot of ozone that's going to be absorbing in the stratosphere, so you don't quite have the same signal. Then we have the clean window, the infrared window. This is the one that's compared to with band 7 in most fire detection algorithms. Then we have the dirty window at 12.3. And you see that those three channels look fairly similar to me. And then we have the CO2. So ju just to show you that band, there are 16 channels on ABI. You can see a signal in, f in s most of them for um, almost any hot fire but the ones that are being used are really just the legacy ones, 3.9 and 11.2. So the fire detection and characteriz characterization algorithm produces three different products, fire size, temperature, and radiative power. Um, and there's some masking in there to give you information about the pixels. It's only produced right now for CONUS scans, which is every five minutes and full disk, which is every 15 minutes. So it's not being produced for the mesoscale domains. You can look at the 3.9 in the mesoscale domain if you have a fire that's so hot um, that's going to be spreading very quickly over one, mi over, you know, over one minute time scales. Uh, but in, in routine, for routine operations, it's only do being done every five minutes for CONUS. Some of these, you know, why you need fire radiative power, um, Fire size and for aerosol modeling, these are input into uh, in input into aerosol models. So that's one of the reasons those three things are there. Because you know, I would think, well, you might need fire area and fire temperature. That that makes sense to me. But I don't even I don't quite understand fire radiative power. But I'm not an aerosol modeler. So forecasters use this and it's, there's a lot of use now with emergency managers because of the timeliness of the of the data you can tell the emergency managers that the fire is there typically before they get an, uh, a 911 call I don't know if it's a 911 call in Mexico or not but you call you call for an ambulance or you call for the fire department you dial 911 in the states and sometimes they've already heard, heard about this because they've got a text alert from the National Weather Service because they're a 
pixel has shown up to be very hot. So here's the fine print. Again, not something I'm going to read over to you, but you can look at this. You can look through this if you download this, um, and all these PowerPoints are going to be available to you. <coughs> but again, this is using the shortwave infrared band, the 3.9 microns, the 11.2 micron, so a, a window channel, but not the clean window channel. Um, it's not clear to me why they don't use the clean window, but historically they've used something around 11 microns. So. And then as you see up here, it also uses this 0.64 microns and the 12.3 to look for clouds uh, and to make sure what they're seeing is not, a, what they're seeing is, uh, not being affected by clouds. So we have 12 different categories of, of fires. Processed means that the fire is detected. They have all the information about it. They have the temperature. They have the area. They have the fire radiative power. So it could be something that could be input into a model. So fire radiative power, again, this is a direct measure of intensity, how much energy is being re released by that fire. <coughs> I want to talk a little bit about the Planck function and how this works. So we have um, wavelength on the bottom here. So we have the 11 microns here. Um, this might be because of the position of where this is in the Planck function versus you know, 10.3, this might be why they use 11.2 because there's a better discrimination between the two when you have a fire going. So the 3.75, and this is showing 10.8, 11.2 uh, is pretty close to that. Um, <coughs> the energy being re emitted is just so much greater at 3.9 microns. Uh, that's, that's the difference here is what's uh, really being used uh, to detect whether a fire is occurring within a pixel. Fires, of course, um, even with two kilometer resolution, are always sub-pixel, thankfully. You don't want a two kilometer size fire burning. Um, so the, the detection is um, assuming some kind of distribution like this, and because w when that happens, you will see a brightness temperature difference between those two channels of between 2 and 4 Kelvin. And that's really what's being used to say, okay, ABI is seeing a fire here. So you can, I mean, the human eye, if you're comparing the two, will detect the differences as well, you know, depending on how you've enhanced the image, the, the 3.9 and the 11.2 micron image. So here's an example where we have on the bottom, we have the 11 micron, and on the top, we have the 4 micron as we're transitioning between a region where there are fires and where there are not fires. So the 4 minus 11 is showing a lot of information here, but there's this interesting transition zone where we have these big differences between the 4 microns and the 11 microns between the rainforest and the savanna in, the in this transition zone. This is where you start to wonder, well, is this big difference occurring because a fire is occurring? So you have a big difference in the brightness temperature at 3.9 and 11 microns, and you use that to say, to, to do further investigations on whether or not that there's a fire. So we have an animation here. I hope, let's see. Well. It is not animating. I don't see it animating. Well, that's unfortunate. What, what you would see, though, is they're looking at the same scene where we know that there's a fire occurring because this is like apartment building under construction. Um, and it shows up in band 7, but it does not show up in band 14. It's just telling you something about the sensitivity of band 7 to the hot temperatures, the sub-pixel hot temperatures. But band 14 doesn't show it. So I'm guessing that this next one is not going to animate either. Although they're animated GIFs, so I would think they would. Nope. 
Well, hopefully, if you download this on download this onto your own computer, you will see same animation. Of course, this is a nighttime thing, so nothing is happening in band two, but it shows up in band seven and fourteen, and you also get this processed fire. The nice thing about this is you knew there was knowledge of exactly where it, of exactly where it was because we knew what was burning. So Go Six, it was just a single apartment building being built in Oakland, California. It was burning, and Go 16 could see it. This was when Go 16 was in the test position, um, so it was 89 and a half degrees longitude. This is at about 124 degrees longitude. So that's a fairly big sun. There's a, that's a fairly big displacement um, from the sub-satellite point, and yet Go 16 could still pick up this little fire. Um, so it's really a very sensitive uh, instrument which is kind of exciting. But it also makes it difficult for this automated biomass burning algorithm because it was created with a less sensitive instrument. So there's been some, I would say, growing pains in getting it to function as they want to with GO-16 versus GO-13. This was under construction, so I don't think anyone is living there. Okay, here we have an example from, so I live in Madison, which is here. This is Dane County in Wisconsin. We have one pixel. So this is nominal two kilometer resolution at Nader. Um, up in Wisconsin, it might be three to four kilometers. So how big do you think this fire is? It's being detected by ABI at 75.2. So we're at uh, 89 and a half degrees west, 75.2. This is actually shown here. This was just a gas explosion and then the subsequent fire and there wasn't much of a signal here because the fire was all contained within these walls so I think a lot of the energy was going up it wasn't detectable from the satellite but it was still able to get an area estimate an area of about five acres I don't know if that's five acres that looks a little bit smaller than five acres to me um, so as I said some fire detection might have been blocked by the walls so it's a very sensitive instrument. You can see very, very small fires, um, especially if they're fairly intense. Okay, this is probably not going to be animating either. And this is a bummer because this is showing a single house fire. So this is one of the cases where there was a very small detection, very small change in the 3.9 up here. Let's see if I can get it. No. Nope. Well, there it is. Very small change in the 3.9. So it's, it's something you can notice with your eye, but it's much less than the diurnal range. So if, if you watch this over the course of the day, this whole scene got very, very warm because it was daytime, uh, because, it was, um, because it was in March. Um, so there was significant warming, but there was a single house fire. So this was, this was the case where the National Weather Service said, there's something burning here, and the people, the fire station the fire people pulled up to find this house on fire. Um, so it's excellent for emergency man for assisting emergency managers to tell them, you know, where are this where are these fires maybe starting so they can get there a little bit earlier to work on them. So these are things that were um, you could qualitatively see them in the 3.9. The, the algorithm never really caught them because they're such tiny fires. So you have to keep that in mind if you're relying on the algorithm to detect the fires. Sometimes the fires are so small that it hasn't reached that threshold that the algorithm says, okay, there's a fire. But you can typically see things under the 3.9 with the 3.9 microns. <coughs> Here's another example. This, is, this one is not supposed to be animating, so that's a, this is over the Yucatan. Um, and you, I hope you can see here a whole bunch of dark spots. So this is enhanced so that darker is warmer. And the question, of course, is are all of those dark spots fires? And it's a very challenging region um, because you have very strong insulation warming up the Earth um, and how it's being warmed up is a function of what kind of vegetation is on the surface. 
So you can get a hot spot forming that might not necessarily be a fire. So this is a much more complicated case. So you can enhance it to see better details. So we have things that look you know, more likely to be fires because these are, the, these are the very hottest pixels. And here's what the algorithm showed, that there were indeed processed fires all over the place on this particular day. We're getting close to the region where there's, um, <coughs> well, I would call it sun glint, um, if it's in the visible, but, but there's a uh, region where there's extra 3.9 micron reflection uh, coming in. And if you have lakes, for example, um, or any kind of water body, that can give you a peak in the 3.9. So one of the important things to know is that you know what exactly might be burning. So if you can match these pixels to something that's vegetated and burning versus you know, uh, an empty lot that is full of sand, um, that's, that's helpful in determining whether or not these are actually um, actual fires. So again, uh, algorithm improvement is ongoing. So. Uh, this is, okay, we'll go back to, this is what the current algorithm shows. Um, this is what a earlier version of the algorithm has shown. Again, they're working on the algorithm to make sure it's better, uh, it, it, it better reflects the observations from the higher resolution and the much better um, precision of the ABI instrument. So, goes to these all different fires. Um, and I guess I should mention, back to those very small fires, typically they don't, they don't last very long, and that's one of the reasons you need GOES to determine them. You might be able to see them better with a polar orbiter, but that polar orbiter might be viewing someplace over the ocean when the fire is burning. So you need the temporal abilities of GOES-16 to detect the fires even though you might not have the great spatial resolution that you get from NOAA 20 or SUMI NPP, which this algorithm is also, um, a version of this algorithm is also, can also be applied um, to polar orbiters. Okay, so this is another case of a uh, very quick fire. I'm afraid it's not gonna animate, which, will be, which is unfortunate. Um, so it, it peaked at 2001 UTC um, which is 2 p.m. in the afternoon um, in Oklahoma in March, and then 20 minutes later it was gone. So again, highlighting that you really need good temporal resolution to detect these. Yeah, not animating, and I don't know why. Um, <coughs> so let me just tell you that if this were animating, in the middle here you'd see a red processed fire show up and then vanish. and it shows up in band seven very nicely. So here we have it in band seven. It will not show up in band 14 because again, band seven is the band that is very sensitive to uh, the warmer temperatures. And the question was, why did this fire go out? Why was it detected and then not? They, nobody, this is a case where nobody knows what was going on because there was nobody on the scene. So if it was a grass fire, it went out for some reason. I don't know if it ran out of fuel or what was going on. Um, so they do have controlled burns. You typically don't have controlled burns during high fire. Um, this, this was a uh, red flag day, which is, which is what they called them in Oklahoma when the fire uh, hazard is very high. So you have strong winds and low humidity. So probably not a controlled burn under that circumstance. But somehow this fire started and went out, and the ghost was able to observe it. Now this is, a, this is another fa fairly famous fire, the Tubbs fire. I've shown you some imagery from this already. So it's um, this must, the most destructive wildfire in California history. Um, killed 22 people, burned 37,000 acres, and a lot of... Um, buildings in Santa Rosa were destroyed, including, I don't know if you remember Charles Schultz, the creator of the Peanuts comic strip. It burned down his widow's house. Um, no official statement yet on the cause of the fire. Um, this started very quickly, it was in the middle of the night. 
Um, the supposition that I have is it was from wires coming together and sparking. Um, there's no indication that it was human caused. Well, um, arson caused. Yeah. So fortunately, I have each of these um, individually. So here we have at 9.37 uh, Pacific time. So this is every five minutes. And you notice in those five minutes in band seven, you do see something changing very quickly. So this fire started very fast. It wasn't detected at 9.42 by the algorithm, but what is detected at 9.47? And one of the things that's very interesting about this is just how fast it saturates. So this fire, um, I think this is 10 minutes after that first saw it, it's showing, an it's showing saturation. So it saturated the pixel, so it grew very fast. Um, it grew very hot very fast. Now, there is an artifact in here that you will sometimes see be that's based on the remapping of from the ABI grid to the fixed grid. They do a remap, and if you have a very, very hot fire, the remap will introduce cold pixels surrounding that fire. So this white region in this enhancement is cold. So around this very hot pixel, um, you can think of the remap kind of as a, as a smooth function. It's moving along, and it does have a little negative before it, it goes up. So there's, I think it goes a minus, 10 per, minus 2 percent on either side of the pixel and a very large number on the pixel to, to help with the remapping. And if you have a very strong hot signal, that minus 2% will introduce colder temperatures. So this is at 9.52. After 10 minutes, it's, uh, it's, it has saturated the pixel. Then you'll just see how fast it expands. Oops, how fast it expands in the region. So we have a sat saturated pixels, very hot fire. So within 20 minutes of apparent, of becoming apparent, this, the, the fire has saturated the sensor. Need the, the file that it's uh, They're that animated GIFs, so yeah. they should be embedded within the within the PowerPoint. So, uh, so you don't have the, 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 the files that go. This is, is this, uh, this one is not. This let me see something. Okay, so what if I do a, where do I start? Because I started the power, this sí. from here, okay, okay. but you can do it from up here to in a, no. Yeah, well, there's one. Slideshow. Okay. Oops. Uh, we started from the beginning. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's just jump up to the, jump to the first animation. No. Yeah, they're animated GIFs because typically when I put an animated GIF in a PowerPoint, it just auto it because mm -hmm. that's what I was all doing yesterday. Mm. So, oh, wow. what's changed since yesterday? <laughs> that's okay. Okay, so I don't think we're going to be able to figure out exactly why the, the animations are not working. But, as I said, if you download these um, after this conference, they should work on your computer, I hope. Um, and then if not, I'll, uh, I'll work with Gabby and we'll get the animations out to you. Okay, where was I? Tubbs fire, that's right. So it's a good thing he put that Chris put these in each time each five minutes. So again, this is a very quick, um, and so th what this kind of shows you why you really need early detection. This is saturate the fire in 20 minutes. Um, and if you're waiting in the middle of the night for someone to notice that a fire is happening, you might be waiting a long time. Um, if you have an automated system that says, okay, here's a fire, 
alert the people who need to know about it. Um, you have some lead time here where you you can get the uh, um, you can get the firefighters out there or start alerting the people around it to a start evacuations a lot earlier. And that's one of the real nice things about uh, the first of all the five minute refresh with Go 16. So again, this is growth to saturation in 20 minutes. With Go 13 or 15, you get every 15 minutes. You've missed a lot of the first part of that. You've potentially missed a lot of the first part of the fire. <coughs> so here's just an example showing uh, differences between GOES 16 and 15 for this fairly obvious fire. So notice this is, this is a true color image. So this is a, re a red, green, blue composite. And the nice thing about RGBs during the day is smoke is always very apparent because it has a characteristic color. So if you're trying to detect exactly where the smoke plumes are, um, this kind of visible imagery, visible combination of visible imagery is very useful because in the infrared channels, it's very hard to detect smoke until it gets very thick. Um, so if you have thin smoke, this, this looks pretty thin, this probably had very little signal in any of the infrared channels. If, it, you know, if you have a pyrocumulus on top and you get a cloud, that shows up very nicely. Or if the smoke gets thick, it shows up very nicely. So, um, of course, the 3.9 micron signal will penetrate this smoke for a while until it gets too thick. So the fire detection should not be um, impacted too severely by thin smoke. You'll still keep seeing that smoke. So in this case, we have observations from Terra and Aqua using MODIS from Veers on, I guess this is probably Sumi NPP, not NOAA 20, from GOES 15 and from GOES 16. And you'll notice they all have, you know, I would say there's agreement here. Um, you know, taking into account the different times that the observations are being made, the different spatial resolution, um, things, are, things look fairly similar. Again, note the nice, the nice part about GO-16 is it has great temporal resolution. So here's MODIS at the beginning, Aqua in the middle, and you've kind of missed the big growth and decay of the fire. And then with Sumi NPP, he just has one observation here. So you've missed a lot of the early, uh, of a lot of the early part of the fire. So that's why GO-16 is kind of vital. Here's another example. Um, let's see, one was 24th of March. This is 10 days earlier. Comparing GO-16, which is here, we have similar observations from Terra, Aqua, and Veers. Ghost 15 never saw this fire, and the question is why. So I won't ask you to uh, volunteer your answer, but this, the, it's not size. It's the view. This was on a sloping, oh, so, so here's, Ghost 16, here's Ghost 15, unfortunately not animating. Um, but the difference is, the fire was in the mountains. It was on the wrong side of the mountain for Ghost 15 to see it, but it was on the correct side of the mountain for Ghost 16 to see it. So that's just one other thing to think about when you're trying to detect a fire. If you're in mountainous terrain, Ghost 16 is over here looking on this side of the mountain, Ghost 15 over here looking on that side of the mountain. And the fire was on the east side of the mountain, Ghost 15 couldn't see it. So this is Oklahoma. Maybe you don't think of Oklahoma as very mountainous, uh, but there are mountains in the eastern part, the Wachita Mountains that go up into uh, Missouri and Arkansas. Of course, it's very flat. But Mexico is very mountainous. Um, you're Kind of fortunate right now when GO17 data are flowing, it's at 89 and a half. That's pretty much over uh, the Yucatan. I think, I think that's where 89 and a half is, um, maybe a little bit to the east. Um, but when you have GO16 at 75.2 and GO17 at 137, 
um, you have to keep that in mind. If you see it in one, if you see a fire in, in one satellite but not in the other. So now we're just going to do a little, a little game here. This is, should be a little bit more interactive. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the game Battleship, where you say, you know, G6 where is where you're putting, where you're shooting people. I'm seeing nod, heads nodding. So you all played this when you were teenagers or, 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 or younger. Um, so I'm going to show you some gridded coordinates, um, 0 0.64, 3.9, 11.2, loops that will follow the frames. I'm guessing they won't animate, but we'll see. This is for, um, this is not a case in Mexico. When I was looking for cases in Mexico that were similar to this, um, it was unfortunately a somewhat rainy period, so are there too many clouds. But we're up here in Manitoba and Saskatchewan. So here we have, uh, Manitoba is here, Saskatchewan is here. This is the Canada-United uh, States border. <clears throat> and if I were to say, you know, how many fires are you absolutely positive that you see there? Four. Well, I see one, one, two, three, four. How about that one? Or this one? This one? <laughs> see, this is the difficulty with bad temporal resolution. Your eye will really see a change in an image as you go from one, day, one time to the next. But if you just throw up one thing, I mean, maybe this is a town. Could be an urban heat island. I don't know if it's uh, Regina, Saskatchewan, Saskatoon, I don't know. I'm not that up on my uh, Saskatchewan towns. Um, but I know there are some of fairly large size. But of course, those wouldn't change that quickly with time. But if we go to the next image at 2015, we'll just toggle between the two of them. Um, and I'll say, how many fires are you more? Do you see a fire that's developing? And I'm looking at F8 down here. Something is changing at that, at that point between these in these in this 15 minutes. So again this is Canada is does not benefit from being within the conus projection for go 16. Um, the limit is something around here. So this is only full disk imagery. So you have something over Canada because you have five minute imagery um, all the time in Mexico. So there's 2015 then 30 minutes later, oop that little pixel that I thought was a fire developing here gone. So again, a very quick fire shows up and it's gone. But look what's happening. There's something happening here now. So this is a very dynamic day where things are starting and extinguishing very quickly. This fire actually looks to be like one that's pretty intense. So it's growing with time. So 2045 is here. Uh, 21Z, 2115. So how many fires do you see now? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. So they're really pretty much everywhere. They're showing up everywhere. Um, this is one reason why you need, well, um, this is also a fairly large region. This is the entire province of Manitoba, and here's Saskatchewan. So it's a fairly, fairly large region. Um, but if you have responsibility, for example, the southwest part of Manitoba, um, and you have this kind of information, it's certainly going to help your job because um, there are not a lot of big cities out here. There are not a lot of people living out here. This could be a fire. Of, I mean, a small fire like this can grow under the wind, the, the spring winds of Manitoba and Saskatchewan. So you probably have a south wind here at 20 to 25 knots. So this could quickly become quite the conflagration um, and if you have a city that's downwind of it, that's something you really need to know about. Um, so you could probably see the smoke plume, um, but you really do need to know exactly where it is for, for responders or any kind of uh, uh, people responding to that fire are, are going to get to. But 2130, that fire's gone. Um, so it looks like the fires are slowly 
a lot of these spires are um, tapering down. Some of them are not. This one is also continuing quite robustly. So 2230, 2245, and 23, 23.15. So I hope this is just showing you how dynamic the, f the fire scene is. I'm just going backwards here, and I'll run through it again. So showing you how dy dy dynamic the fire scene is, and just with this one band of 3.9 microns, using that, um, you can determine where you might need to send resources. So that's the important, that's really the, for an emergency manager, that's really the uh, takeaway for this. You've got, here in Mexico, you've got five minute imagery. You can see how things are changing over five minutes and you will know pretty, pretty quickly exactly where resources to fight a fire might be needed. Um, or, you know, if a fire is burning, and but, but then not showing so much intensity and you know if the wind is going to be dying down and maybe more moisture is coming in, that'll show up here too. And you won't need to worry so much about that fire. So this is just a still image um, at, at the beginning. So you, you do see the smoke plumes um, for the major fires. Um, some of these small fires um, never really produce enough smoke to be visible. But they do have a signal. So relying only on the visible imagery, of course, is going to be difficult because it doesn't produce a smoke plume um, with any, it might not produce a smoke plume with timeliness that you need uh, for the beginning. Here's the 3.9 micron. The 11 micron, some of the hottest fires will show up in the 11 microns. Um, and they do on this case, this big fire here showed up in 11 microns, but the small fires that were down in here uh, were not showing up at 11 microns. And the fire mass captured the big fires. Um, so we have these processed fires, which means it's, it's identified the fire, it's created a fire temperature, a fire radiative power, and a fire area. Then we have a high possibility fire, saturated fire, medium possibility fire. Um, so there are all these different fire legends. Um, so these, these are all the things that come out of FDCA. Uh, I know that in the Weather Service, the National Weather Service, what they only get are the processed fires. So they have a fire temperature um, in AWIPS, a fire radiative power in AWIPS, and a fire temperature area and radiative power. <coughs> so here's a case um, where another a case in Saskatchewan and also in mid-May of this year, um, very dry, windy day as, as typical. Um, so it's typically, you know, after the, uh, it's before the vegetation has started to grow in the spring. So this one was interesting because, uh, unfortunately not animating, but it, you, would, you can see how the a wind shift is coming through here and it changes the characteris char characteristics of the fire. So when you see an obvious wind shift coming down, what happens typically is the fire will flare as the, the wind will change it. And it'll, first of all, the wind will ventilate the fire and also change the direction of movement so it'll it will potentially move it over unburned regions. So, the fire detection and characteriz characterization algorithm for this did a pretty good job. Um, but as again, there is uh, ongoing work f with FDCA to make this uh, do a better job. So, I'm sorry that the animations didn't work. Um, but here's my, an you, you've already have my point of contact and uh, Chris Schmidt's email is there, and he is um, the algorithm developer. Um, he, so he primarily works with GOES imagery. There is a, I would say, a parallel um, effort going on, ongoing for uh, NOAA 20, SUMI NPP, polar orbiters that Ivan Cesar at NOAA is, is the point of contact for that. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions.
Entonces, eh, como, como siempre, tenemos algunas preguntas aquí de este interesantísimo tema que nos expusieron. Quedamos abiertos. Por aquí hay una. Gracias. Este, bueno, hola. Muchas gracias por la presentación de incendios. Aquí arduamente la doctora Lilia Manso trabaja con incendios y yo colaboro un poco con ella. Entonces, tengo una duda acerca de el, cuando detectan los incendios en el algoritmo, ¿tienen un umbral dinámico durante el día o es fijo para detectarlos entre la banda 7 y la 14? You mean compared to day and night? I mean, ah, entre el día y la noche sí son diferentes los umbrales, pero durante el día, este, la doctora Lili ha encontrado que, al parecer, es dinámico a comparación con Modis, que sí es fijo el umbral para para relevar los incendios más fuertes, ¿no? O, o que o que saturan más rápido el pixel. Pero en el, en, aquí en el caso de Goes, como tenemos ya una imagen multitemporal que es muy buena, ya que se pueden detectar desde el momento que empieza el incendio hasta que termina, ¿es fijo el umbral o es dinámico? Uh, that's a question that Chris could answer that I cannot answer. Ah, okay. I, would hope it, I would hope it would be because, I mean, I, if I were making this algorithm, I'd be looking at like a footprint around a pixel that I think is hot mm -hmm. to compare that. Um, and I think he must be, there must be a change in the threshold because the surface gets so warm, especially at this time of year, that if you're using a fixed threshold, you're going to be detecting fires everywhere. Okay. So I don't know the answer for sure. You can, you can email Chris and ask that question. But my, my guess is be, based on what I see, and how it detects the fires, so that yes, there is a threshold that's changing with time during the day. At least I hope so. <laughs> okay, thank you. Because that, that would make sense to me. Okay. Gracias. Gracias. Eh, ¿Alguna otra pregunta que tengamos? Maestra Gaby. Yeah, so, you said there's no availability of uh, the uh, FTP or well or any source of data right now that we can uh, see at the internet or uh, get information of uh, uh, this kind For of the products. fire products that's fire correct products. because it is, has not reached provisional maturity okay. and once that happens I think it flows out over the GRB okay. so they're still working on minor changes to it so they're more confident that it's mm -hmm. doing what it's supposed to be doing. So for the time being, you, what you have to rely on is, you know, comparing 3.9 and 11.2 and where there's a big difference, that's where this algorithm is going to be detecting. Yeah, so it's, uh, once it, it is uh, maturity, uh, reaches maturity, then it will be uh, true, uh, the products that we receive as uh, the direct broadcast, no. Then I think, um, that the or, or C, uh, we can process through CSPP. The uh, fire products are not yet in CSPP Geo. No, it, they are not. Right. Yeah. So yeah. that has to be updated as well. Yes. I think they've been waiting to make sure the al to make sure the algorithm is stable before they put input it into CSPP Geo. Uh -huh. um, the data that flows. I mean. The, the interesting thing for me about this is that the weather surface offices are getting fire area temperature and radiative power. Uh -huh. So it is flowing in one sense, and they're getting that because it has reached provisional maturity. Uh -huh. And I think they're waiting, or the algorithm developers are waiting for a, a bit better, a bit more stable algorithm before it flows out over the GRB. That's my understanding. But the, but the data, the, the, the so when weather it's, service so is only for U.S. Yes, I but guess. for example, when this is when it does reach the next level of maturity, um, I know my my office mate who works with Real Earth, which I've shown you a couple of times, is will be interested in putting it into Real Earth so you can compare, so you can download it there. So there'll be, and I'm sure other people will do that too. So there will be sources 
online where you can look at this fire, this FDCA product in real time. And then you'll be able, you'll, CSPPGO will also be, when it's, um, I guess, updated to include this, you'll be able to use, it, use that as well. Okay. Thank you. And I think CSPP has the, well, maybe I'll, do you know if, I don't know if CSPP the, for, for Polars, because there's a fire product for the Polars as well. And I think it is in there, but I'm not certain. Hay dos preguntas, hay uno primero por allá y luego por allá. Yeah, I regret that Chris could not give this talk. <laughs> eh, ¿Existen casos en los que el algoritmo pueda detectar señales parecidas a incendios? Que no sean incendios. Yes, there are false alarms. Um, I've seen a lot of them with the AHI with the AHI instrument over Australia, where it gets really very, very hot. Um, I haven't seen quite so many over 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 uh, the U.S. with ABI. But yes, if you have a very hot pixel, it can be misidentified as a fire when it's simply just solar insulation is really heating up uh, someplace in the desert. So I guess it's. That's kind of a, where a human has to be there to say, well, it's saying there's a fire there, but I don't think there's anything b available to burn. So you have to have some human knowledge of what's of the what of the uh, of the uh, geomorphology of the of the of the uh, place that's being identified as potentially burning. Eh, otra pregunta: eh, ¿Existe algún producto que considere el algoritmo este para obtener eh, algo como el potencial de incremento o la intensidad del incendio en función de eh, análisis de, de otros canales como vapor de agua, qué tan seco está el ambiente o la superficie o la cobertura vegetal. I would think um, the three water vapor channels won't be very useful for that because they're not seeing down to the surface typically. So they're not going to tell you what kind of moisture do you have at the surface because the water vapor is looking at the mid-troposphere. You could use the veggie, uh, you could like it's an NDVI derived from the 0.64 and the 0.86 to say, okay, is there green, you know, how green is the vegetation that this fire is moving toward that might slow down the spread or how brown is it that might increase the spread? So if you have a region you know, if you have a fire in a region that's moving toward very highly reflective region in 0.86, which is, to me, would say it's very high, strongly vegetated, and not, I would expect that the fire would not, maybe not move through there because the vegetation is healthy, versus where the 0.86 might not have quite so much reflectivity, where you would have dead plants that are ready to burn. Pero no hay un producto operativo como tal. Um, from Go 16, I don't, I mean, a satellite derived product, other than the NDVI, I don't think there is one. Um, there are, I mean, there's a total precipitable water, you might be able to infer information from that, but again, that's not going to give you stuff at the surface where the fire is burning. I mean, there's a correlation between how much TPW there is and what the surface dew point is potentially, but it's not going to be, I mean, I wouldn't be 100% certain. Okay, we have one more question from this side. El código que tienen utilizando es interno o hay modo de acceder a él? En dado caso, podríamos hacer alguna prueba a nosotros o adaptarlo a nuestras necesidades o si no pues tienen eh, papers well the the, the uh, lots of papers so the baseline FDCA algorithm I believe is freely available The ATVD, the famous ATVDs, right? Yeah. So, on the, I was looking at it, yeah. on the website. Okay. so, so Jim was saying that 
most of the most of the baseline products and the fire detection is a baseline product for go 16 there's something called an ATBD the algorithm theoretical basis document Hold up real quick while you're talking. and it has all the information on how how the products are developed I would say the difficulty in that is for products are being updated or modified I'm not sure how quickly that information gets into the information that's online. So th the better thing to do, I think, if you want this, would be to, to, detect, to contact Chris Schmidt directly and say, I would like to tweak your code. Is it available? I don't know if he makes it available, but he can, he can say yes or no. So. Una, una última pregunta. Hace un rato mencionabas que el sensor es, tiene una sensibilidad muy, 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 bueno, tiene mucha precisión. Y ayer no sé si escucharon que eh, el doctor Magaña comenzaba, comentaba sobre la posibilidad de ver islas de calor. ¿Crees que pudiera haber uh, algo relacionado a esto en zonas, en las ciudades? Pues. Um, a couple. I'll try to answer this, making a couple statements. Um, you re you might remember from the ABI talk yesterday that channel seven, the three point nine, has the most bits. It's a fourteen bit channel, so it has sixteen thousand three hundred eighty four possible um, values that it can identify, and those are mostly. It's, it's designed so that those are mostly at the, high, at the high region. So if you're looking at very cold temperatures, don't use 3.9 because there's just not a lot of, it goes down to like minus 75 Celsius, but the, the, it, it, it doesn't make, it, when, you're, when you're at those cold temperatures, you're looking at a difference between minus 75, minus, maybe minus 73, minus 71, so that you can t detect those temperatures, but there's no precision. All the precision is at the higher temperatures. Um, as far as urban heat islands go, I'm not. A, um, this this will this detector will also be more sensitive to detecting exactly where the hottest part of the urban heat island is going to be. I'm not sure if that is answering your question or not, but um, so it. it Anything that requires differentiation at very warm temperatures, 3.9 is designed to be able to do that. So, ur ur urban heat line would be, urban heat island would be one of those things, in addition to fires. Alguna otra pregunta por aquí? Gracias. Uh, um, Scott, thank you for your presentation. And something I hadn't seen in such a detail is that you shown the the image of the energy and the energy emission uh, at 700k, which is about the, just fire, but it's very high. It it is much higher in the seven band. This is the 3.9 micrometer than at uh, 11 micrometer. It's a lot of energy. And just to mention for the aviation. One of the problems for aviation is smoke from the agricultural fires. In general, say in Mexico, and I know in some Central American countries, maybe somewhere else as well, in some cases the smoke stays there and we had traveled for aircraft operations. And there are well-known airports uh, which have the, this problem. And the thing is that the agricultural practice practices are such that they use fire insect instead of insecticides in some areas. And uh, the thing is that if you have full moon one day, they will start before the sun comes, comes up. So you don't have visible. With, with this one, this seems to be a very useful tool. And this is when the fire it gets out, out of, of control when it's very large. I think this is another of the uses that the the band seven, the 3.9 micrometer may have, and that's for aviation. Right, it'll Thank tell you. you where the fire is starting, but it's yes, not gonna what, it will not tell you where the smoke plume is spreading. Uh, so, like it, 
it is true, but more or less say uh, there are some agricultural practices, for instance, and in some areas, Mexico, for instance, that's more or less in May, you have the fir first passage of the sun at the Senate by the middle of May. The second one is, oh, this week, actually, that you have it here, it's the maximum of solar energy, but it's in the first passage before the, the rain begins that they have this, uh, they burn the, say they have the fires and the agricultural fires, and sometimes they are in agreement with the authorities and the fire people and so on, sometimes. sometimes but sometimes if you have the full moon, and when it is not very hot, because in daytime it will be very hot, it's right. the maximum of solar energy, and if you have full moon, they start in the, at night time. But I think this is a good tool, it might be a good tool to detect fires. And yeah. we know some airports, for instance, Villahermosa, Mexico, Don Contin in uh, Honduras, and that th they have these practices. And this may be a, uh, has a, a lot of potential, this tool and these images, just as a comment. Uh, yes, I would think so, because you will know the fire is starting early. Yes, and if it's very large. If it makes smoke and it's near the airport, you'll know that there could be a hazard there, so yes. I just wanted to add to what Scott said was that if you couple the fire detection with the modeling capability, then you have a powerful tool. And there's a nowcast capability used in um, the United States. It's especially useful in California where they have very strict air pollution rules in regards to agricultural burning. It's, uh, they do a daily blue sky run, and blue sky is a capability that couples fire detection uh, right now using MODIS, but with a dispersion model to determine roughly where the smoke coverage and concentration could be. It's a very rough calculation. And then as you have more information, you can run a more detailed uh, model calculation using the amount of emissions that you think you have, uh, and then put that into a dispersion model. Does that tie into what you were saying? Sure. Okay. Buenos días. Eh, nosotros estamos desarrollando también un algoritmo de puntos de calor basado precisamente en el eh, en la ayuda que desarrolló Chris Smith para preliminar para GoSR y si sí hemos encontrado muchos elementos que nos han permitido identificar esos puntos de calor. Sin embargo, considero que los incendios en México son muy característicos especiales porque se pueden presentar en zonas montañosas o en zonas planas pero también tenemos zonas desérticas que alcanzan temperaturas muy altas o en las zonas planas en Yucatán que, son, que tienen mucha nubosidad durante todo el año y a veces durante todo el día, entonces también eso contribuye a necesitar además de basarnos en, en la información de la banda 7 y la 14, máscaras de nubes, máscaras de, de agua y tierra, e inclusive de vegetación. Porque, por ejemplo, muchos puntos se pueden dar relativamente cerca de la planicie costera, donde hay manglares o donde se puede confundir la información del punto de calor para identificar si es incendio agrícola o incendio de, de vegetación realmente, algún, alguna selva, por ejemplo. ¿no? Y, y nos gustaría mucho saber, por ejemplo, qué umbrales están manejando en la banda 7 para poder tener nosotros una, un, un mejor apoyo para, el, para el, el algoritmo. Tenemos un algoritmo muy preliminar, en donde sabemos más o menos los umbrales que debemos de manejar en la banda 7, en la banda 14, o, o las nubes, o las máscaras que tenemos que identificar. Y, y si ustedes 
tienen disponible, disponibles eh, eh, resultados preliminares, sería importante poder compartir esta información. Uh -huh. That kind of ties to the first question as well, and I would urge you to talk to Chris about this because he has mo far more knowledgeable than I am. I know that one of the things they do input is some kind of land use mask, which is a challenge because you have to keep it updated. And if you have a stale, like, or if you have an out, if you have an outdated, you know, it's it's not a forest anymore. It's now agricultural, and your algorithm doesn't know that. That's a real challenge. Um, cl cloud masks are a little bit easier because those are I think those are pretty accurate. Land sea mask or land water mask is usually pr pretty more accurate, but the uh, land use mask is the is the real challenge because that also changes the emissivity of the earth, which feeds back into what you might expect the difference in 3.9 and 11.2 to be. Um, so again, I'll uh, recommend emailing Chris about that to talk about that. I don't know if he speaks Spanish though. I'll have to ask him. <laughs> you might have to, tra well, Google Translate will change your email from Spanish to English. ¿Alguna otra pregunta tenemos por aquí? No veo ninguna. Entonces, antes de, de pasar al coffee break, que eh, vamos a hacerlo a las once y media, regresaríamos aquí nuevamente a las doce para continuar con la presentación del doctor Lindstrom. Pero quiero aprovechar para hacer un pequeño comercial por parte de la Agencia Espacial Mexicana, aprovechando que tenemos, estamos hablando del tema de incendios forestales. Para el mes de noviembre estamos realizando gestiones con la Comisión Nacional Forestal, la CONAFOR, y la Agencia Espacial Francesa, CNES, para hacer un taller exclusivamente para cuestiones de incendios forestales para el mes de noviembre. Entonces, si alguno de ustedes tuviera interés, se acerca conmigo o con Jesús o con Gustavo, que lo tenemos aquí muy ocupado, eh, para darnos sus nombres, su, su correo electrónico, y nosotros nos pondremos en contacto para invitarlos. Muchas gracias. Entonces, por favor, que disfruten sus cafés y sus galletas.